Sarah, welcome back. It's good to be back. We're diving straight in today to talk about, not Netflix, Amazon Prime this time, on yeah. cycling documentary. Yeah, I can't, absolutely cannot wait for this. This is called All In and yeah, very similar to the Netflix Tour de France kind of Unchained series that we were all captivated by last year. So cameras basically went and embedded themselves on the team bus and the hotels during the 2023 season of Jumbo Visma, now Visma Lisa Bike. And Free sponsor, correct, sir. <laughs> There's been some hilarious content from White Van Art lately online. I don't know if you've seen it, where he's reacting to every time the commentators and the pundits call it Jumbo Visma and he's just like eye roll and it's really, really hysterical. It's hard for the commentators, I think, to change all the sponsors' names every year. But anyway, this Amazon Prime series, basically, it's been released in a couple of countries, Belgium, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, a couple of places like that. It's not available in I. Ireland, the UK, I think the States, it's going to be released later in the year. Unless you have a VPN, Unless you which have I'm going to VPN. check out later because I haven't seen it yet. I cannot wait for this. I live for these fly on the wall documentaries where you get to see people's personalities and like what actually happened. This one is particularly interesting to me because we were stuck to the Vuelta a España last year. So the show basically covers the Tour, the Giro and like I said, the Vuelta a España. And remember those tensions and how high they were between Sepp Kuss, Jonas Vingegaard and Primus Roglic along as the Vuelta a España kind of unfolded. Sepp went into the red jersey and his teammates, teammates, he needs enemies when you've got teammates like this. They seem to be chasing him down, attacking him and, you know, trying to take the red jersey from him after all of the years and dedicate super domestic work that Sepp Kuss did for these guys. And they just came and stabbed him in the back. So let me wait, just... Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I think there's a couple of bits to it. Firstly, these documentaries are typically shit. Unchained was pretty bad, so maybe we shouldn't get our hopes up too much. Well, it was un- Unchained wasn't that great, but I think they were trying to bring non-cyclists into a cycling world, kind of like the Formula One version of the Netflix series. So I think coming at it from cycling fans, and you've been co- like covering cycling, you've been watching cycling for so many years, there was definitely holes in it. But I think that there are some good documentaries, flying the wall documentaries. That the Wolfpack seen. was pretty good. That was very, very good. Yeah. I think we watched it and Roglic is not there anymore. He's at Bora Hansgrove, which is a bit instructive as to how bad the rift was. There was some stuff I'm just really curious of. The last stage, was it Monzonkalong? I can't remember. Yeah. Someone correct me in the comments. Yeah. And also tell me, actually, I'd be interested to know if people still like Roglic because yeah. he went from probably my favourite rider to my least favourite rider. Right. And when I talked about Roglic and Vingegaard doing the Sasev Kuss on the podcast, people came for me. I mean, these guys have very serious, serious fans who really, you know, like really were standing up for Roglic at the time. But this show really does go into and shows you the team bus and what's happening and has very kind of insider quotes from the riders as to what was actually happening. Now, after they had been seen to kind of chase down Seth Kuss, Vingegaard apparently... Well, they didn't chase... Wait, wait, wait. They didn't chase him down from what I remember. Or am I remembering it wrong? They dropped him. They dropped him. Yeah. Well, that was, that was the next thing. So they were, they weren't, they were, they were letting him ride, but they were chasing after him. They were for the first couple of stages when he was in the red jersey. Then on that stage at, what was the climb you said? Zonklong. Yeah, the Zonklong. After that, apparently the team director who is uh, Mersian Zeman, after that incident, he actually had to call a team meeting to say, we're riding for SEP. They were the joke though, because the, the management were saying that day that the the radios didn't work and that's why they couldn't communicate effectively. But I, I think on the Roglic point, I went from loving Roglic to hating Roglic. But actually with time now, I'm beginning to understand Roglic is a winner. Roglic is a leader. And I don't think it's entirely obvious that a leader isn't always a team player. A leader leads. He's a number one. He's not a supporting actor. He's Michael Jordan. He's not Scottie Pippen. And that's not always that palatable to take. And that's not always in the interests of 
fans, you know, the greater good because he wins at all costs. Maybe that's why I know you have a question later on about who are the highest paid riders in the world. And you know what they all have in common? They're all leaders. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But anyway, looking forward to seeing this and kind of Sepp's reaction. Apparently he does have some absolutely brilliant quotes throughout the documentary. His reactions to the two guys, as I said, attacking him. What's one of his quotes? He said, he's never again in my life want to be a leader in a grand tour. But I think he's he's a Scotty Pippen, isn't he? He's a number two. He's not the he's not the main character, even well to Catalonia this week, where on paper it looks like he's out and out the team leader, no doubt. But they're saying, is he the team leader? Is he not? He should be clearly saying, I'm the team leader. I had a friend who was teammates with Mark Cavendish at HTC Columbia. And he was contrasting. He was also teammates with Wiggins at Sky. And he was saying their leadership styles were so different because Wiggins at Sky, he just sit back and he wouldn't really say anything. But Cav would give these impassioned speeches where he'd say, guys, if you believe in me, if every single one of you is 100% committed to me today, I can win. He's like, I can win with all of you guys there, but I can't win without all you guys. So he stood up and he's like, he's asking to be followed. He's saying, I am the leader. Trust me and I'll deliver. I don't think Sepp Kuss has that. Yeah, no, I have to say, I agree. Okay, what did you make of Milan San Remo, the most boring race on the calendar <laughs> ever, every year? But yet we're always... It's always the one we talk about. It's always the one that gets loads of loads written about it. And we're always on the edge of our seats starting at kilometre 294. Yeah. Because that's where the, it really kicks off. And it's interesting. They brought live coverage from the very start to San Remo for the last two or three years. I think maybe a little bit longer. And I would still tune in all day, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Because it's almost what makes it brilliant because it builds and builds and builds to this amazing crescendo. Mm. It just gets more and more selective until you hit the Cipressa and then it's winding up and then you hit the Poggio for this like amazing burst and climax. I actually love the way it plays out. And, you know, we can go out riding for the, do the roadman group ride in the morning, come back and you get that last 15k and you've missed nothing. <laughs> and the Poggio for me is so iconic because every time I'm out on a really difficult ride, I've been out all day. And even if there's like the tiniest incline on the way home I'm like oh this is my Poggio now I have to just get over this this is decisive the Poggio is a metaphor for the last hard it efforts is. in yeah. any ride now yeah absolutely I uh, top Pogaccia's team weren't this is not a particularly hot take I think everyone uh, assumed they were going to ride the Cipressa in sub nine minutes which is around the Strava record with that tailwind I think they rode it in 927 which is relatively pedestrian for given their tactic I don't think UAE had a plan B. Their plan was put the team on the front on the Cipressa, ride a full gas, ride the Poggio full gas, but they ended up just not having enough men left to the Poggio. Didn't make it hard enough. When Pogaccia went, no one was really tired enough. Pogaccia afterwards said it was a super easy race. But my hot take on it is Bling Matthews threw it away. Bling Matthews. And this is a race that I have, that Orica franchise, you know, because Caleb Yoon has been second and toured so many times as well. Bling Matthews got passed on the barrier. And it was only when I look back today at it and I was chatting to a friend, Bling Matthews is a sprinter and he got passed on the barrier. Like the very first thing you learn as a sprinter is don't get passed on the barrier. And Andre Greipel on the podcast, and I asked him a question, I was like, what's the most important thing you learned? And he said, the most important thing you learned is also the very first thing you learned as a sprinter, close the barrier. And Bling didn't do it. He's like a lad who was just so used to sprinting for second, third and fourth places that he was anticipating getting past. Yeah, he's got the, I don't want to say loser mentality, but he doesn't have that first place mentality. How gutted was he afterwards though? Oh I my know, God, yeah. my heart absolutely went out to him. He's been on the podcast, like a great interview. Lovely laugh. Yeah, so, so nice. And uh, yeah, I just wish my name was Bling, my nickname. I'd love that. Bling. <laughs> Do you want to know an interesting stat? Uh, Pogaccia, the last time he's finished outside the top five in a road race was the last stage of the Tour de France into Paris in 2023. Oh my God, that is insane. That's consistency for you. Oh my God, watching him uh, last night or the other day in the, the Volta, or how do I say that? Volta right? Catalonia. Volta Catalonia. He is just a different species. Like he is just absolutely 
insane. Okay. Anytime we talk about Pogaccia, Sarah begs our video editor, Wes, to put up a picture <laughs> of Pogaccia on the and screen. Here it is. <laughs> oh, friend. He is my friend. Uh, look, I'm going to be a lifelong fan after reading him. He is such a legend. Okay, let's jump into the question. My wish is hands down the best virtual cycling app for home, and it's redefining indoor training at no cost. Yep, it's absolutely free. And setting up my wish is really easy. Just download the My Wish app, connect your device like your Watt bike or your smart trainer and off you go. Now, if you're feeling competitive, there's weekly races for every category from beginner to pro. Plus, there's insane prize money up for grabs. Now, if you've no plan to race, that's no problem. There's hundreds of free training plans and workouts that are designed to really push you to your limits. You can enjoy daily group rides and group workouts, and you can customize your avatar all without opening your wallet. So go on over to the MyWish app and have a look around. Why spend money on monthly subscriptions elsewhere when MyWish offers all of this for free? So join MyWish today. It's available on iOS, Mac OS, Google Play, Apple TV, or click on the link in the show notes to get started. Bike nerds, I need your thoughts. I'm assuming you're the bike nerd, Ant. Maybe we'll see the question, see how technical it is. I blasted up my local hill, Dark Hill, in Richmond Park today on the gravel bike in 44 seconds, which matched my time on the lightweight, carbon frame, carbon wheels, 28 millimeter tire road bike. Now I'm questioning everything. The gravel bike is aluminium. It's chunky 45 millimeter tires that were a bit soft. There was very similar road and wind conditions today too. Both max effort attempts only a few weeks apart. And that's from Tom. Conspiracy theorists. Can you explain this? He said the wind tunnel data's <laughs> forged. I think, yeah, carbon frames, carbon wheels, they're typically lighter and they're more aerodynamic as the price tag goes up. A lot of R&D, as we covered last week, definitely go back and check that out. We kind of dug deep into that. But the actual impact of these technologies on short, intense climbs, it can be a lot less than expected. Climbing, it's more about power to weight ratio than it is about aerodynamic performance. So that could be one factor. I think there's also something that you can't discount is the psychological impact of knowing you're on a heavier, slower bike and then finding just a little bit extra going, I'm on a slower bike, so I need to dig a little bit harder and maybe getting a bit more out of your own performance. And then I think the final one is just, you know, I know he said conditions where, what was his quote? They're similar. Road and wind conditions today. But conditions are crucial because even a slight variation in conditions can have an oversized impact on performance. So I think any one of those could account for it. And that's maybe a more logical conclusion to jump to than he's been duped. (laughs) There's so many variables. You know, did you have as much deep good quality sleep? Did you have a couple of glasses of wine a week ago? You know what I mean? There's so many variables. I have to agree with you. I think it's totally the, you know, okay, I'm on my gravel bike here. I'm going to really go deep. And Urgh, yeah, give exactly. her a bit of, Give her, give her, giving her up the hill. That would be definitely what I'm saying as well. There is like a big uh, move to these things. I don't know if it's a marketing ploy or, or what it is, Anthony. There's a skeptic in me now, but climbing bikes... Is that, what is that? Just lightweight bikes? I know one of the You used to be climbing people. Now just climbing (laughs) bikes. Okay, very good. Next question. Hi, Anthony. What is your opinion on the idea to raise the UCI bike weight limits? It was mentioned in the Peak Torque podcast with Dan Bingham as a way to push innovation in cycling. By making the minimum bike weight 8 to 9 kilograms, it would open the manufacturers up to be able to add remote sensors, explore different bike materials, even look at additional things like dropper posts or cameras. The example was Formula One, where the additional data and video helped the team and the video footage can be used for video coverage too. Thanks, Joe. I talked about this in the podcast, not too, well, quite a while ago. So they stole my content. Oh my God. You <laughs> need to get on to Dan Bingham. He's meant to be coming on the podcast. <laughs> Dan, where you at? Uh, it's a great idea. I think having a higher weight limit would mean manufacturers' hands are less tied and they can experiment with more robust materials without having to shave off every single possible gram at every junction and turn they come across. So that's going to mean better safety, maybe more aerodynamic shapes, and potentially for the consumer, or something we talked about last week, what do we care about? Longevity. Like if I drop my bike at a coffee shop, is it going to break? So I think all those are 
great. And then you have to talk about the advancements in technology, like some of those F1 sensors for monitoring bike performance, maybe inbuilt uh, metrics for monitoring rider health data. I don't know if there's some angle on concussion. I don't even know how that would work, but I know that you know, when you start innovation, maybe it's something that we can start figuring out how to monitor some real-time health metrics from riders. But I also think about the fans' perspective and having more cameras in the Peloton maybe could have this more immersive fan experience. We've seen the drone footage from a couple of years ago, which was phenomenal. And apparently the uh, Tour de France are considering, it's basically almost over the line, that they're going to use more drone footage during the Tour the de France this, was brilliant year. With this yeah, year. Yeah, exactly. It's absolutely amazing. So annoying. I remember Van der Poel, the drone's basically on his shoulder. Oh yeah, the, just that buzzing. I do like watching the crit racing in America when they have all the GoPros on. It, it really is, as you said, very immersive. And yeah, it is quite good. Not sure if I completely agree, but like raising it to nine kilograms, I completely, I understand that it does give a bit more kind of leeway for people to experiment. The weight thing for me in particular, like you can add sensors on your average Joe soap or 90% of the people that are on our group ride. They can add these sensors on, they can add lights, they can add yeah, but The thing is it's top down, no one's making them. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're, they're not making these advanced health monitoring metrics because the pros aren't using it. Normally drips down like Stephen Seller had on. And I know a few people in the comments criticized his idea of why we need Formula One teams. And he said, we need Formula One teams because the tip of the spear drives innovation. And then you get the, the paddles that you change gear on coming down into your family's saloon car 15 years later. But that's only possible because of the tip of the spear is innovating. The tip of the spear, I think, is being curtailed in a renovation at the moment with the weight limit. Yeah. My only other kind of pushback on, like, let's say, putting the minimum weight to nine kilograms would be the world tour and the pro female riders who are all extremely light. Now, you know, you'll also get like very, very light male riders like Cantana, those like absolutely tiny, tiny males like those climbers. But if you look at like a 45 kilogram female rider, nine kilograms is such a massive weight. The difference is that men are genetically stronger than women, even at those very, very light weights. So my just big concern there and going up to these minimums of like eight, nine kilograms is that it is going to be quite difficult for the girls to lug those bikes around. Okay, I recently read that Tade Pogaccia is the highest paid cyclist. Do you think these athletes are worth these huge amounts of money plus endor endorsements plus brand deals. I know it's always been the case with high level footballers, but these huge fees seem to have crept into the peloton now. Pogaccia, interestingly, hasn't got a pay rise since 2021. Poor Pogaccia. He makes 6 million Kinda a year like in 2021. Me. 2022, 6 mil. 2023, 6 mil. 2024, 6 mil. His wages aren't even adjusted for inflation at the moment. <laughs> God, Poor love Pogaccia. Him. <laughs> Whereas Roglic, 2 mil, 2 mil, 2 mil. 2.9 mil in 2023, 4.5 mil with Bora Hansgrove this year. He has more than doubled his salary in the same time that Pogaccia hasn't it's got anything. Static. So we may yeah. need to set up a GoFundMe for Pogaccia. <laughs> but Jonas, 2020, 2021, he was earning 875 an hour working in a fish factory. And now he's on 2.5 million a year last year and 4 million a year this year so you know it's come out this week that Jonas Vingegaard wasn't actually a fishmonger that like he yes he did work in a fish factory but he was already in a pro team and they put the he was the, in a Conti team yeah the Conti team and the Conti team manager used to put the riders into this fish factory <laughs> to work in the mornings and train in the afternoons so like I, I don't know. I think there's been a bit of a bit of a Disney story written around Jonas Vingegaard and that fishmonger thing. But yeah, I think, do you think that these guys should be paid this this kind of money? They're the, we talked about the tip of the spear. They're the yeah. tip of the spear. You know, how many people are tuning in? I don't have the data on it, but how many people are tuning into cycling? How many bikes are they selling? You look at the, the Roglic effect on Bora. Like they had an exceptionally low baseline because I think in the 2023 Tour de France, they had the worst social media stats across all the World Tour teams. And now they're up to one of the best World Tour teams. Now that's maybe they've put more marketing budget into prioritizing Instagram and stuff, but also the Roglic effect. I've started following them on Instagram. 
I want to buy a Bora cooker. <laughs> <laughs> You've always wanted a Bora cooker. <laughs> Since Sagan was there. <laughs> I think they should be paid. I feel that like the organisers, uh, race organisers, all of that money, there's money in this sport. And I feel that the actual riders who are out there all winter training, they're away from their families. They're not going to that wedding because they've got a race coming up or somebody's sick and they can't go and visit them. So I fully believe that these riders should be paid the big bucks. A stat we don't have here, which I'd say is quite an embarrassing stat, is how poorly the female riders yeah. are paid. Yeah. Like if you look at the top, I have the top 10 or so, down to Egan Bernal, who's 10th place and he's earning 2.5 million a year and he was earning a little bit more last year. Interestingly, he's the only one whose salary seems to be going down, but he was probably on an old contract and then coming back from injury. Yeah. So he's still quite well paid, but 2.5 million. I would say he's paid multiples of the highest paid female rider. Oh yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. <laughs> Another interesting thing I've noticed from this is that Matthew Vanderpool is apparently worth half a mil more than White Van Aert, which is quite interesting. And Matthew Vanderpool signed a 10-year yes. deal with Canyon. Interestingly, he didn't sign with the team. He signed with the brand. So assuming now that Canyon are going to follow Vanderpool from team to team over the next 10 years, how that deal's broken down in terms of win bonuses, how the deal's broken down in terms of regression if he doesn't hit milestones, I've no idea, but that's only come out in the past week. Yeah, I'm sure it's all very complicated. I'd love to have a little look at that contract. Okay, Anthony, I love your mullet. I'm not brave enough <laughs> to get one. Plus, I think it would break a few codes in the corporate world I work in. Any worst or best cycling haircuts that pros have had over the years? And of course, the big question, does the mullet make you faster? I don't know if it makes you faster, Anthony. It makes you absolutely just you know, women can't control themselves around you. <laughs> the worst haircut now, and I wouldn't say they're a pro by any means. Uh, it must have been you, Sarah, when you went and you got your hair bleached and they burnt off all your hair. Oh my God. That must have been your inspiration for the mullet. I, when I first met Anthony, I was very into myself. My hair was gorgeous. Everything was perfect. And then I had a hairdressing disaster. And so Anthony still... Still fell for me. You look so. like Mitch Docker when I was going out with you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, stick a picture of Mitch Docker picked, up there. Yeah, Mitch can rock it. I didn't have the moustache, thankfully, that Mitch had. Everyone has moustaches now. What's yeah, going on with cool. that? Jay Vine has a moustache. They're, cool. they're just cool. Yeah, Moustaches are just really, really cool. Everyone should try one at some stage of their life. Mitch Docker must be up there on the podium of worst haircuts. And we're going to throw on Shane Archibald, Bennett's former lead out man. The f I think he was called the magic mullet or the flying mullet. Like uh, he has leaned into the mullet. I mean, it's not just like a subtle. This is full on office at the front, party at the back. Yeah. It's really cool. And I've raced him <laughs> quite a bit in person because he used to race for Unpust. So he'd race him against me in the Ross quite a bit. And then Wiggins, the mod, mm. was pretty out there with the sideburns. Yeah, that was very, very either. See, I think at the moment, unless you've got a mullet or long hair, I I have a sneaking suspicion that Matthew van der Poel is going for a mullet at the moment. I've seen his hair look very long underneath his helmet over the last couple of days. But because we're not, because the helmets and the glasses kind of cover the rider's full face, it's very hard to distinguish their haircuts. I don't think it's like, I don't think the individuals are really, you know, you know, given that much kind of chance to show their individual personality. No, now. we need to go back to a place where everyone just races in caps with the good luffs. Oh, you're going to get cancelled for saying that. <laughs> okay. Hey, Anthony and Sarah, I know that you guys have an infrared sauna and I'm thinking of getting one and putting it in my man cave, but I wanted to know why you went for an infrared sauna and not a traditional type one. Thanks, Ed. You love the sauna. Road men, I'm going to date myself here, but I've been riding the bike for almost 20 years. And in that time, I've cycled through every cycling apparel brand out there. And I kept swapping out different apparel brands each season until I found Lacal. There's something really different about Lacal. And as soon as you slip into the gear, you notice it feels different. It feels better. I've had the pleasure of chatting with Yanto Barker on the podcast. He's the Lacal founder. And his dedication to crafting the fastest, most refined cycling apparel out there 
It's nothing short of inspiring. Yanto isn't just trying to create gear. I get the feeling he's actively and obsessively trying to perfect cycling gear. Trust me, as soon as you slip on the Lacal kit, as soon as you zip up that jersey, you can feel that commitment. The proof for Lacal, it's in the pudding. This is the same kit that Jay Hindley wore when he clinched overall victory in the Giro d'Italia. There's a confidence that comes with wearing apparel that's been battle tested and podium proven in races like the Giro d'Italia. Trust me, feeling good on the bike means you're you're gonna perform better. If you have a second, I highly advise you to jump on over to lacall.cc and check out their amazing range of kit and experience this feeling for yourself. I do love the sauna. I like the sauna for, you know, I know you have some of the science nerdy stuff on why it's good, but I think it's a it's a space that's almost a protective bubble around it. It's hard to do anything else in the sauna. You can have, you know, your radio or Bluetooth into the sauna so you can listen to a podcast. But that's about it. So I just sit in there and I listen to podcasts or I listen to music. You can't be on your phone when you're in the sauna. You can't read when you're in the sauna. You can't hold a conversation really if you're in the sauna. It's too warm. It's like, it, it's a space to kind of escape the world nearly. It's a little safe space to be at the end of the day. And it, it, it's quite a nice contrast to your normal life that's quite easy and sitting on the couch. I'm big on this contrast piece. I think I had Colin O'Brady on the podcast ages ago and Colin O'Brady rode across Drake Passage and he talked about this crazy storm that battered them all night and they were lucky to survive and they were in a crawl space and they were puking on each other. They didn't know if they are going to make it through the night. And then the storm subsided the next day and it was like calm looking out over the bay and he said it was the nicest sunrise that he'd ever seen in his life. But he didn't think the sunrise the appreciation of the sunrise is possible without the storm. I kind of think about that with the sauna and doing hard stuff. It's nice to sit down and watch a movie on Netflix or the new series on Amazon Prime that you're talking about, have a cup of tea and have a biscuit or something. But that's not as much fun if you've done nothing hard all day. If you've done the sauna and you've got out of it and you've had your cold shower and then you go and sit on the couch, it just feels totally different. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I have to say I'm not, I do use the sauna occasionally, but I find it a real chore. I mean, it's not easy to sit in the sauna. You're absolutely baking. It's very uncomfortable. But what I will say is you feel incredible after it. So there's a couple of types of sauna. I'll go into this really, really quickly for Ed and I'll tell you the reasons why we went for the infrared sauna. So the conventional saunas, the ones that we would really have known and kind of come up over the last kind of 20, 30 years, they are heated because you're throwing water over a pile of hot rocks, essentially. That's very, very old school. And that heats the air in the sauna to these really, really high temperatures. And they can go from kind of 170 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 70 plus Celsius. That's kind of the minimum temperature that you're going to get in one of these. Like they go up and up and up and up. So as I said, the, hair, the air is heated first and then your skin and then eventually your bore, your core body temperature starts to increase. Now the infrared sauna is different because it emits these infrared lights and even though that's invisible to the human eye it is experienced as heat now these wavelengths of the light will directly penetrate the skin so it kind of starts heating your core from the inside out and you'll usually get the saunas to get to about 120 Fahrenheit. That's about 50 degrees Celsius and up. So they're actually a lot cooler than a traditional type of sauna. So they're a bit more comfortable to sit in, even though you're getting a lot of the benefits of getting that core temperature really, really high. So there's been a million and one studies and all of the studies that I looked into were based around men in Finland because sauna and sauna use has been used there for like eons. So there's been so many health benefits, um, improved heart health, better blood flow, fro- flow, stress relief, muscle soreness, and then that just like calming sense that you experience when you're in there as well. So the reason that we went for an infrared sauna is basically infrared saunas are a little bit less more, less expensive to buy. They're less expensive to run. Um, the traditional saunas are a bit more expensive to install. And then the infrared sauna is much more um, easy to heat up so that it'll be kind of warm within 15, 10, 15 minutes. Whereas the older saunas take ages to heat up, like you're talking 45 minutes in some instances. So that's why we went for the infrared. Another thing to watch out for, Ed, before you buy is that there's three types of infrared wavelengths. So there's far infrared wavelengths 
they will basically just kind of penetrate deep past the skin and into the body, mid-infrared wavelengths. They are to kind of help to, to uh, reduce inflammation and then near, which is more surface level. So please, please be careful and buy yourself something called a full spectrum model. That's the one that Anthony and I went for because it has all of the different wavelengths in it. You're going to get all of those beautiful health benefits. The one thing I will say you will miss from the infrared is that lovely sauna smell, you know, that like lovely cold water burning, whatever kind of wood, woody tones they have in it. Um, but yeah, for me, it was always going to be the infrared sauna. Dr. Rhonda Patrick has some great podcasts talking about this. And I was listening to one recently where she even referenced a study where I think it's three 35 minute sauna sessions per week reduces all cause mortality, including accidents. Wow. which is crazy because it changes your your risk assessment and improves cognitive pathway. So you're better at determining risk or at least they don't atrophy as fast. Like we're all slowly getting a bit stupider with dementia slightly creeping yes. in as we age. Yes. So it slows down that onset of that. So it reduces all cause mortality, including accidents. Try it before you buy it though, because it's an expensive purchase and mm. you know, you don't use it that frequently. And if I wasn't using it, we probably wouldn't get value out of it. So get to the health club and try it out. Yeah, exactly. And and I, what I would say is, great point, go and check out Rhonda because her stuff is insane. She's anecdotally been doing a lot of research on her own mom who has, I think, early onset dementia. And she has found that um, her mom using the sauna has actually helped her a lot cognitively. So really, really interesting. Okay, Anthony, have you got a My Wish ride of the week? Yeah, I don't know if this is going to be a super popular or a super unpopular one. but Super popular. Definitely for me. Well, I don't know if it is, Sarah, because I don't know if you're a big proponent of riding the indoor bike for this long. Oh, so I talked with Dr. Professor Stephen Seller on the podcast, and he is a massive proponent of 80 20 training. So that means 80% of your time is at training low intensity zone two, 20% distribution, high intensity. After that conversation, I realized a lot of my my whoosh session of the week recommendations fell into the 20% and I should be talking a little bit more about the 80%. You don't need to get too crazy if you're talking about the 80%, but what I would do is have my whoosh on on one screen and what I've been doing is getting a really good Netflix movie and sticking it on, on the other screen and literally just sitting there tipping away for two, three hours, you know, occasionally interacting with other avatars to pass the time, pausing the movie, flicking over and then coming back and watching my movie. So it's the unglamorous foundation of what makes cyclists cyclists. It's just tipping away in zone two. The beauty of that is that it's so controlled because I know I do zone two on the watt bike and outside and just even stay in zone two for me if there's like inclines, if, you know, I feel like I have to rush to get through a traffic light, etc. So I d do know that there's a place for zone two training indoors. And there's an interesting observation you can make if you start at, say, you know, for you, zone two rides probably like 150 watts. If you look at 150 watts in your heart rate, it's going to be like 120 in hour one and you're using erg mode and staying on 150 watts. What's happened to your heart rate in hour two, hour three? That's called cardiac drifts or aerobic decoupling. So some things can be causing that like nutrition, like hydration, like overheating. And you can start playing around and manipulating those variables to see if you can minimize that cardiac drift over the course of a session. So plenty of fun to be had. Sarah, thanks for chatting. If you enjoyed this podcast and you want to hear myself and Sarah talking more cycling, please click up here. And I know this conversation is one you're going to love. And please don't forget to subscribe to the channel. That's down here because it helps us reach bigger and bigger guests. See you next week.